Why did you want to be a designer? I, I, I guess what it was was I, I wanted to create a space. I wanted to create a, a world. And that goes back to Saskatchewan, being on a farm, where the only audience was the chickens and the pigs. I created worlds. You know, I, I hung things up in barns to create theaters. I, I created worlds because there was no, no, nothing out there that interested me as much. To escape? Probably, yeah. I never thought of it like that. But or yeah. to fantasize? Hmm? To fantasize? To fantasize, of course. I built, as I got older, I started building worlds that were on Mars and things like that. You know, as you go through that whole sci-fi thing, you, you know, as a young man and creating worlds, etc. Imagination was stimulated by, by stuff like that and you wanted to create it. When I, I did diving at one point, and the first thing I did was I painted my bedroom underwater scenes of fish and things, you know, and coral reefs and what have you, and great murals in my bedroom. We create that world that was sleeping underwater. Yeah, it's, it's just wanted to create worlds. Wow. It's the same as an actor, the same as a writer, same as a director. Yeah. All we do is create worlds. A, yeah. a composer. And tell a story. And tell a story. Yeah, great. A composer yeah. creates a world yeah. in a structured right. piece and, of music. And tell the story. Because we're dissatisfied with the normal world, or we want to see more than the normal world, or we want to escape the normal world? I don't know. All of the above. Oh, that takes All of the above. They always say about clowns, you know, that happy, jovial clowns are the most depressed people, you know. That, Probably a, a sweeping generalization, but, but uh, I mean, the, the actors who I know who, who, who create great worlds on stage, who are great uh, artists on stage, and present company is an exception, by the way, um, don't seem to have the personality when the makeup comes off. That's a special kind of talent. I mean, those people burn in a way that's unique. Yeah. You know, we know who they are, and when they burn on stage, no one can go near what they do. Yeah. And I don't know what that is, but it's, it's a unique and tragic talent at times because it, it they're burning. It can be tragic. It yeah. can be tragic. Yeah. Uh, um, so anyway, it's, it's why I'm, I'm in love with what I do because uh, I'm doing it all the time. You know, when I'm at home and I'm not designing in the theater, I'm working in a garden, designing in a garden or in my studio, you know, whatever the case may be. The film industry, as you know, fell apart here in Toronto because of SARS and all this sort of stuff that, took, that happened and, and the film industry just collapsed. And I was to do, to do a whole series and I left the theatre th that year to do this big series on Grimm's fairy tales. And it collapsed on the, on, almost on the first day. I mean, we were, I had a crew and everything and it just collapsed and we were shut down. Well, running around trying to find a job to get you through the year now was impossible because the film industry was just collapsing all around. What, you, you, you could have got a job like that six months, but now nothing. I did 40 interviews, not oh. one uh, job out of it. Uh, you know, what, what cliff are you going to jump off of? Where's the sharpest knife to slit your wrists? You know, all that sort of thing. I went back to an old love of mine, trains. I had to build, you see, I had to create these worlds. So I created a world of steam engines and locomotives around a part of fa fantasy world, which was not a fantasy world, a real world, around a logging company on Vancouver Island from the turn of the century through to 1956 or so, when I used to visit it and it was, the world was changing into diesel power and all that stuff. And I built that. It stopped me from going crazy because I had to create, and I wasn't getting it. It was funny when I started doing that, and Christopher and I were going to do a show, and he came over to my studio, and I had this train thing running around. <laughs> I found out something new about him. He's a train enthusiast as well. Oh, really? He loves trains. I Double O gauge? I, uh, with him, no. I think with him, he was a, a train watcher when he was young, you know, the British thing, going down to the station and, and look at the numbers on the locomotives and see if you can spot the locomotive, you know, and you have books of them. They, can, they still do it to this day. Right. I think it's called uh, train watching. Train watchers, yeah. Um, take me inside a fitting room. 
Yeah. So there you, you, in the fitting room, you have the actor, you have the cutter, the designer. The cutter. And what do you want out of that fitting room and that fitting session? Well, there's, there's, there's a whole series of fittings take place. The first, the first one is going to be basically putting on a toile, which is a mock-up of what's going to happen, um, getting the actor into their underwear and what have you, which I don't get involved with. You stay out fitting room for those things, but the getting all the undergarments in place, getting then putting on the shirts, whatever, you know, whatever we need to do to start the fitting. And then if, if sometimes you go to the rough cut garment, in the case of tailoring, they put the jacket on and it's got all those little white ticky tacky things going all over the place. They look wonderful. I've always said to each other, I've got to design a show someday where all the clothing is just ticky tacks, tailor's tacks all over the place. You know, I don't know if anybody would see it. Anyway, um, that's the, usually the first fitting. And that is t to see if the cut that's, that's happened is right. That, that the proportion is correct, that everything is ready to proceed with. And that's usually the first phase. It takes about 40 to 45, sometimes even longer, minutes. And that is getting the fit, moving this, moving that, changing this, changing that, taking out fullnesses in sleeves because you cut it too wide or I designed it too big for the body structure of the actor, making sure the trouser lengths are right, that the waist is in the right place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then that goes away, that fitting's over. And the next time they come back is for the second fitting. The, the, all the changes have been made. And sometimes, you're, if you're lucky enough, the second fitting is almost a final fitting. In other words, the actor gets into the clothing, make sure that everything fits. It is what the silhouette is what we're looking for. Now I start adding the hat, I start putting the jewelry on putting together the kit for the actors of what they're wearing, their ear rings or what. And when do you get the director in? I don't. Oh, you don't, eh? No. Okay. I've, the only time I've ever had a director come to a fitting was just, well, I have invited directors to a fitting. I've invited them to see something. But the only time I've ever had a director want to be in the fitting room was with a director who I had never worked with before and he wanted to see what I was all about. And so I invited him to the fitting. He came in, took one look, and he said, great. He never came back again for any after that. Well, as so you say, it's the part of the courtship. Yeah. So yeah. that we, part of the courtship you was see, over. He, was from, he wasn't local. We would never have had that, that happen if he had been a local director, or someone that I could, could, I could meet from time to time on. We had one meeting. Right. The next time we met was in the fitting room. Right. So that's a, it's, it's a risky thing for a lot of people, you know. And I, I understood exactly what the director was coming from. He didn't know me from a hole in the ground. And, uh, and I didn't know him. Lighting designers are obviously important to the set because they... Oh, yeah. Big so time. how do you work out a, a courtship with a lighting designer? Lighting is really important. If I go back to the black box, the first thing you see is usually light, I find out. That if I'm staring into the black void and I put an actor on the stage, I can't see him. So I have to discover the light. So you have a little... Sometimes it can be flashlight. Sometimes I just, if I'm in a real black box, like a wine box painted black inside from the liquor store, I'll take a mat knife and carve a hole somewhere so that the beam of light comes down. Oh boy, do you ever see things in a hurry? I mean, you just suddenly the world starts to come around. Light is, you know, as my old instructor would say, paint with light. Painting with light. That's what lighting design is, is painting with light. You're intensity, an position, environment and everything just with light. You know. And that's that's incredible. A good lighting designer like the late Jeffrey Dallas, you know, what used to call darkness by Dallas. He just lit what was needed, didn't light anything else. And it was just extraordinary. We did a show of of, of the Count of Monte Cristo in Vancouver and didn't have any money and Jeffrey saved us because everything was painted black. And just using a beam of light, creating a long white shaft on the stage, it became a cathedral. As if the sunlight was coming through a door, a great cathedral, and with sound, everybody was in a cathedral. And do you have preliminary discussions with the lighting oh, designer yeah. when you have oh, yeah. the maquette and the, yeah. as to how mm -hmm. you're going to approach 
-hmm. color intensity. Yeah, I'm a, I'm I'm a stickler on that to some degree. That when I'm talking with a lighting designer, I will tell them I want you to limit your color range. You know, right. I don't I don't or I don't want the show to look like orange marmalade. You know, I don't want this or I don't want that. In the case of media shows like the one we're doing right now, where you've got projection screens, you know, they've got to limit their angles because the lighting coming in, hitting the floor and going up on the screen will kill it. So it's got, they've, got to design, they've got to design the whole show maybe a little differently than they would do normally. So who has the upper hand then in the restricting of lighting positions because... Uh well, in repertory theater, of course, you, you know, it's rep. You know, all the positions are there for everybody to use. You don't have much choice. But, but every lighting designer is given a certain, a certain uh, uh, inventory of lights that they can do with what they see fit. In certain positions, they can. And they work, they collaborate with all the other, with the head of lighting and all the other lighting designers on what's called the rep plot. And then, then, so there's six I shows knew. going on at Shaw on that stage oh, in yeah. that summer. They all have to share a rep plot, and then each designer gets gets a, a handful light. of lights that they can of do extras. with as they see fit. And that that uh, that's when I can come in and, and and say to them, you know, I want this or I want that, etc., etc., etc. And of course, what's happening today with new lighting instruments, it's like digital photography, what have you. Right. They can change color just like that now. Um, it's wonderful. I mean, they, the, the technology that lighting has gone through with the computerized boards, etc., and the new generation of lights coming up, like have dichroid filters in them, so they can gain color just like you know by putting a, a, a electronic current through the lens, change the color. You know, it's, it's extraordinary. Mucho dinero. Mucho dinero. Yeah, we don't have them at the Shaw Festival. <laughs>